Good morning and welcome to God Day here on Revelation TV with me, the Reverend Dave Hodgson. It's great to be with you today and I hope you are well and in fine fettle uh, as we start today. Uh, now, we're going to look at what it means to be a true disciple. Now, suffice to say, we're not going to be able to do that in the next uh, 28 minutes. It's going to be impossible to really cover the whole thing. It really takes weeks and weeks of Bible study. There are courses like Freedom in Christ uh, and courses like that, exploring Christianity and helping people to become a disciple. And it can take weeks, and many of you know, it can take years and decades to really truly work out what a true disciple is uh, as you work it out in your own life. But today I want to look at a, a woman who is named in scripture and she's called a disciple of Christ. Now I, I don't know anywhere else in scripture where a woman is called a disciple of Christ. We're going to turn to Acts uh, chapter 9 and verse 36 onwards. So 36 to about uh, 43. And as we move towards reading this passage together, I want to ask you a question this morning. Have, have you ever had a nickname? And now if you have had a nickname and you are able to mention what it is, you know, it's obviously uh, a family show, uh, then uh, put it in the comments below. If you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching it anywhere online, put on the comments below your nickname and it'll be interesting to see some of our viewers' nicknames that you had at school or you still have today. Maybe your husband or wife call you something, or they used to. Um, obviously, some names that you get called can't be mentioned on, uh, on the comments, uh, as good Christian people, of course. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I had a nickname at school, and it was uh, Del Boy, because my friend's dad worked in a skip company and moved skips all over the place, and lots of companies threw out materials they didn't need anymore. But... One man's waste is another man's treasure. So I thought maybe we could go and sell this stuff around the school. So we bought these diaries from Ben Rose Printing in Derby. And we, uh, we got these diaries and we sold diaries and war calendars uh, to people all over the place. The headmaster of the school had it, head of year. Uh, lots of kids in the school had all this stationery from us. Uh, and we didn't know that the whole month of August was missing. And that's why these diaries were faulty. They weren't for sale. They were thrown away. Now... Because it was a six weeks holiday, we didn't get told off until September when we came back to school. And the headmaster said, I bought this diary from you and it's got no August in it. And I, my response was, well, you know, we're off in August. You don't need August anyway. It's a perfect school diary. So anyway, uh, I uh, got a bit of a re reputation around the school of being a dull boy. And I told that story to kind of give a highlight of... Uh, what I was like when I first went to Bible college, they'd get us up to share in the Bible college, in the chapel, uh, in devotions, and they said, tell us your testimony. And I shared that story to tell people what I was like. I was brought up in a non-Christian family. I did all these kinds of things at school. I got into the wrong group. I was uh, mucking around. I was skiving off school, going kickboxing, and just wasn't really great at school. And I told that story about the diaries, and two people in the college started shouted at me when I walked into the dining hall, into the canteen, hey, Del Boy's here. And from that moment on, most of the college knew me as Del Boy. And people now, 15 years later, still will message me, how are you, Del, on Facebook? And so that is a, a nickname that has kind of stuck with me for a while. And I do love Andy Fools and Horses anyway. <clears throat> now, uh, nicknames come and go. But in America... Uh, one of the most, not so much in the UK or in Spain, of course, but uh, Dork, you're a Dork, or Dorcas, you're a Dorcas. And we see here that actually, I'm going to say today, it's good to be a Dorcas. It really is. And it's, I think we all need to be Dorcases. There, there's a quote you can put on, on, the, on the fridge. Now, uh, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And... Now, of course, the name Dorcas in those days wasn't seen as derogatory, wasn't a nickname. Uh, but we see here, um, just after Saul's conversion in chapter 9, um, in Joppa there was a disciple, verse 36, named Tabitha. And translated into brackets here uh, is Dorcas. So there's, that's a translation of her name. Who was always doing good, helping, helping the poor about the time she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Now, we're going to come back to that story in a moment because uh, following the Easter season, I've been uh, looking at things to talk about at church and the whole topic of discipleship is something really strong on my heart right now. And I was reminded of what the disciples did after Easter, after Passover. Uh, firstly, 
we see Peter. I'm going to give you a list of some of the disciples here, and then we're going to just spend a few moments uh, on towards the end of this message looking at the life of Dorcas, and it all comes together. So firstly, we see Peter. Several, several things about Peter. He's a powerful preacher. Do you remember on the day of uh, Pentecost, and he stood up and said, it's... Uh, these people are not drunk because people are saying they're drunk they're speaking in a foreign language they're falling around they they can't stand up they are drunk and peter stands up and says these people are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine in the morning and not even weatherspoons is open yet so it's quite possible that they're not drunk and he didn't actually say that, that was that was the that was my version of it so he's this powerful preacher and we know the story of peter he fails the lord and the holy spirit comes upon him and he's full of boldness and he's at this big Jewish festival where so many Jews make an annual spiritual pilgrimage for Passover to celebrate, sorry, to celebrate Pentecost. It was there that God enabled Peter to preach that message where 3,000 souls were saved. But he also had an amazing miracle worker. He was an amazing miracle worker. He remembered the account of the crippled man begging. I'm going to move my notes up here so I can see you a bit better. Um, the crippled man begging for money by the temple gate who was miraculously healed. The guy was so excited that he was jumping around, leaping and praising God, the Bible says. But not everybody was happy. In fact, Peter and John were in jail for a while because of, of that very issue. But then they're given an opportunity to speak and I love what their accusers said about them. Look at this, listen. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. I like that bit because that gives me hope because I didn't do much at school, as I said earlier. Uh, and I'm a pretty common, you know, that's my wife. Uh, so uneducated common men. <laughs> and that's like an, a, an insult. Where I'm from, it's like, yay, yeah, that's kind of like a badge of honor. Probably wrong, but yeah. Um, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And so they're saying, What's, what is it with these guys? They're just normal, everyday guys. You know, they're, they're not fully educated. They're, they're not rabbis. They're, they're not recognized by anybody in society in any way, great way. Um, they're just, they're common in the words you see them, just like every other guy on the street. And yet something about these guys is that they've been with Jesus. And I want to say this today, you may feel quite normal. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure if, if I met you, we could all have a conversation about how normal you are. But you might say, well, actually, I'm, I didn't do much at school. I, you know, I've got a job, I've paid the rent, I've, I live a life, I just you know, do what lots of people do. And, but when you know Jesus, he can use you. And it doesn't matter what background you have, whether you're middle class, upper class or lower class, you can be used by God. And they said, these are common men. You know, they're like everyday guys, what's happening here? They were astonished and recognised that they had been with Jesus. Now, you know, that's a great thing for a non-believer to say about you. you. You know, I don't know, I really don't know how this has happened, but there's something about those guys, they've been with the Lord. And I don't know if anybody can say that about our lives, you know? They're just everyday people, but something different about them. They've been with the Lord, it's amazing. And so that's Peter, John. Uh, we come to now and John uh, a great disciple of course John was Peter's ministry partner and uh, talk about nicknames he and his brother had a great nickname they were known as sons of thunder we need some like special effects we have some special effects on there right now uh, like sons of thunder like we need some like lightning strikes coming in almost like um, uh, Marvel, Marvel characters you know I, I love my Marvel films so um, and the Avengers and so on. And they, they would call themselves Sons of Thunder because they had all kinds of great zeal for the cause of Christ. I think that's great. Imagine that Sons of Thunder Pentecostal church meets here half past four on a Sunday. One day they were turned down, kicked out of a Samaritan town and they wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy the town. Now, I don't know if you've ever had some bad experiences in ministry, but I've not got that far yet where I think, you know what, I've had enough of these lot. Let's just, Lord, would you just send fire down from heaven? No, and Jesus has to say, Hang on, I, know you, I know you've got this great nickname, I know you're sons of thunder and I know all that and you're doing a great job, but guys, listen, we, we don't do that sort of thing. That's not the way things are done. You know, that is not the way that I'm telling you to live. And, uh, but he recognised their zeal. And you know, sometimes in our zeal, we will do crazy things actually, you know, and sometimes we need to do some crazy stuff. 
But calling fire down to consume people is not what God wants us to do, just in case you were wondering. Uh, well, John went on to partner ministry with Peter to write five of the New Testament. I love this. The guys that call themselves the sons of thunder and they're exasperated. They want to call fire down from heaven. God says, actually, you know what? They're going to write the New Testament. I love that. Thank you. So uh, they write five books of the New Testament. I think that's right. Yeah. And in the book of Revelation, he wrote when he, uh, John wrote when he was in his 80s or even possibly 90s, some scholars say. One thing I love about John is that he was still in ministry, going strong, even as an old man in his 90s. I hope by God's grace, I can do that as well. And uh, maybe in my 90s still be annoying people with my sermons. Number three, Paul. His name was Saul first, of course. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish I had a more exciting story of conversion. Uh, Paul's story is fantastic. We know it. I'm not going to go into it today, but Paul had a great conversion story. He's ravaging the church. Uh, he's, set, he's persecuting the church in so many ways. Uh, and, and he believes in, you know what, if only we could just completely annihilate the followers of this Jesus, then we'll be all back to normal and everything will be fine. Just we can wipe it out off the face of the planet and never to be heard of ever again. And Jesus unilaterally sweeps in and turns his life around. What a testimony he has, the most aggressive missionary of the first century. He was a prolific writer and it may well be, this is another Bible study, that Paul has been here where Revelation TV is. People talk, has, Spain been, has Paul been to Spain? And it's a big debate. He was on his way to Spain. Now, we've got John, Paul, and now we've got Ringo. That was a joke. It's not Ringo, it's Stephen. Uh, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. He was chosen for a very simple task in the church. He was called to distribute uh, food to Hellenistic widows. You might think, well, how qualified do you have to be to pass out food? Uh, but this is what I found amazing. And as I've been studying this, I've just been blown away by it. These guys were walking in miracle signs and wonders, and yet they were also really held passionate about giving out food to widows and helping people and, and getting and helping people reach where they need to be in life looking for the outcast and here's some of the qualifications he pos uh, possessed act six stephen full of grace and power great uh, more of that lord please help me was doing great wonders and signs among the people he was moving in miracles what would you give and let's let's say we have the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in each one of us. You know, maybe today somebody's going to come across your path who needs a healing touch. First of all, ask them if they need it and they want it. And then pray and see if God does a miracle in that situation. So they were moving, you know, I think sometimes the reason we don't see the miracles is we don't actually step out enough. And that's a challenge to me as it is anybody else. As time went on, Stephen's giftedness became very obvious. Preaching performing miracles. He was getting a little too popular for some of the religious and political leaders of the time. You know, sometimes we need to be Christians that annoy the religious people, that we actually say, you know what, I'm not interested in what religion has to say or what people's expectations of me are, or people's, people's man-made rules and conditions. All I'm interested in is what, what does God think of me? What does his word say about me? And so, and maybe as we do things and live that authentic life, we might ruffle a few religious feathers here and there. And I think that's a good thing to do. And if you've got religious people upset with you, welcome to the club. Jesus had it as well. And so does Stephen. And they brought up false charges against him. And when he was brought before the Sanhedrin, he preached the gospel that rocked their world. They were cut right to the heart. He exposed them for what they were, exposed their hypocrisy and their rebellion. And people don't like that, do they? In their anger and jealousy, they picked up stones and they put him to death. Stephen, who looked after widows, who was a great hero of the early church, man of great wisdom, stood up to the Sanhedrin and was Christianity's first martyr. What I like about this is that in this situation here, two things. One, Saul, who was to become Paul, is standing there casting his lot against Stephen and he's, all, he's looking after the cloaks. He's running the cloak room while the stone is going on. And we see a vision of Jesus and the only time in scripture, we know that the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of God right now. That's where he is, interceding on our behalf. But in this moment, you see a vision of heaven and Jesus standing up from his chair and looking down. 
and he's moved by what he sees. Fifthly, Philip. Philip was another one of the seven men who were picked to deliver food for widows, but God had gifted him in incredible ways as well. After scattering and, uh, and dispersion of Christians from Jerusalem at the beginning of Acts 8, Philip went on uh, into the region of Samaria. Basically, um, goes to Ethiopia, the Ethiopian eunuch, he preaches there. I believe there's Christianity in that area today because of all the great people that have preached there over the years, but part, partly and originally because of Philip. And Philip, uh, is this great man of God. And basically at this time, the disciples are being persecuted. They're scattered around, but wherever they go, they're preaching the gospel. And it's quite a list of heroes. Peter, John, Paul, Stephen, and Philip. And each one of those could have five God days devoted to them. Let's get to Dorcas. And right at the end of that list, there's a woman disciple called Tabitha, Dorcas. Now who is Dorcas and why did Luke feel compelled by the Spirit to include her in this chronicle of the early church. Here's a little histor historical perspective. I mentioned after stoning of Stephen, things got pretty tense for the followers of Christ. They caused many Christians to get out of Dodge and, and, uh, and, get and, and go other places, and they took the gospel with them. Philip, who was, considered, who was just considered preached in the gospel, he healed people baptised people and he started churches. One of the churches he started was a little coastal town uh, called Joppa. And within that church, among that small band of new believers was this woman called Dorcas. Now sometime, something else was going on at this time. While all this was happening, Peter was on the move as well. He was going out and you see how these people start to come together. It's like the story, it's like a Netflix series. It kind of builds and it all comes together at the end. He was going out various places, visiting believers, preaching the gospel. And at the same time, he was in the neighboring town of Lida, or Lida, very close to Joppa, 10 miles away. The Lord was really working through Peter. In this town of Lida, a man who was sick was brought in the bed for eight years. Peter prayed and he was healed and the whole town of Lida came to Christ. Well, let's learn about Peter's encounter with Dorcas this, uh, this morning here. Verse 36, now there was Joppa, in Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Brilliant. Again, let's go back to where we were earlier. Full of good works and acts of charity. Amazing. Tabitha, which translates as Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor, in verse 37, about that time she became sick and died and her body was washed, as was the custom, and placed in an upstairs room. Lida, or Lida, was near Joppa, 10 miles away. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they went uh, and sent two men and urged, Peter, we want you to come because our friend has died. Peter did. You know, that just amazes me sometimes. We, we overlook that verse quite quickly. Two people said, look, we need help. Peter went. Quite often people need us. And there are times when we physically can't get there for whatever reason. And we've got other commitments. And that's how life is. But if you can, get there and help them. And Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows were there. These were the widows that Tabitha, Dorcas, that Dorcas fed, helped, clothed. These widows were all there and they were absolutely amazed. And you can you imagine the picture? All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes. It was like a funeral fashion show. They had the tunics that were made by her for them. And crying and showing him, him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still alive. Can you picture walking into the room? The emotions are high. It's charged atmosphere and the expectations on you as a man of God walking into that room, a woman of God walking into that room. And they're showing all, and they're showing all the clothes. They are paying a visual tribute to this amazing woman Dorcas who, who fed them and clothed them and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter, in verse 40, sent all of them out of the room. Now, 
wasn't being rude here. He was saying, look, there's some business that needs to be done and we need to pray. And so everybody out. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. It wasn't a great form, formulaic prayer. It wasn't a massive, let's get everybody around and lay your hands on and reach your hands out and let's put it on the WhatsApp group and let's get it live on Facebook Live and let everybody know about it. Let's get as many people praying as we can. It was a simple, simple prayer. And it actually was a command. He spoke to Tabitha. And we have authority, excuse me, I've got something in my mouth. We have authority uh, and we can speak into those situations. And here he simply says this. He doesn't go into a long-winded prayer. He says, Tabitha, get up. He commanded her to get up. He spoke to her. And the amazing thing happened. This woman who's been dead now for a while opens her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. Now that's pretty freaky, isn't it? You know, imagine that happening. I mean, it's okay, we believe we can raise people from the dead, but when it happens, you can be a bit freaked about that. And there, you see, she sits up and, ta and does what Peter says to do. And then he called the believers and the widows. Can you imagine? As they walked out of the room, she was dead. Ne never, you know, we're not gonna see her again, but they had enough faith just to believe that this could actually happen. And as they walk back in the room, they see her. Now, can you imagine if you're Tabitha, if you're Dorcas, what you're gonna do in that situation? You know, you die, you pass away, and then suddenly you're brought back to life, and the first person you see is the Apostle Peter. And it may well be that she's like, who are you and what's going on? And I don't know what her relationship was with him at the time, I must admit. Peter didn't hesitate to go. And we see that, we see the same thing happen in the Gospels. Peter didn't hesitate. He knew God was up to something. Sometimes we don't always know what God is doing, but we just have an inkling that he's doing. That's a Derbyshire term, I think. We just have an inkling that he's up to something. And uh, we just got to go with it. And it's a kind of, you know, this is exactly the process Jesus followed with Jairus' daughter. He sent people out of the room and said, little girl, get up. And Peter saw what Jesus did and he copied him. That's not a bad place to be. See what Jesus does and copy him. The purpose of God as a missionary is to see what Jesus does and copy him. Pray for the sick. Be an encourager to people. Show them the way. Lead them the way. Um, one of my missionary heroes is Hudson Taylor. He was a British, British missionary to China in the late 1800s. He founded a China Island mission and he basically became a Chinaman. He grew a beard, he wore the Chinese clothes, he absolutely integrated into their culture. And although Hudson Taylor was a great incarnational missionary, the, gre the greatest incarnational missionary was Jesus. He dwelt amongst us. He became like us to show us a better way to live our lives. And what I love about this here is Dorcas is back and she's alive and she's serving the Lord again. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with the tanner named Simon. And I love that because Peter thinks, God is doing something here. I am staying here, my friend. I am staying here. God is at work, and people's lives are being changed, and I'm going to be part of that. And so uh, he just stays there and sees what the Lord is doing. And you can imagine this woman who would have been so well known in her community has died and Peter commands her to come back to life. And they have her back again. You know, they hug her, you know, before social distancing. They hug her and they, they embrace. Uh, there must have been so much tears and crying going on, tears of hope. And we see right in the midst of a desperate situation, Peter comes in and commands a change. And you know, there may be situations that God will bring us into in our lives, where there's desperation, where there's people that need us. Folks, uh, God has a plan for you to reach more people for him. 
and it may be today that God will bring people across your path and they just need to hear it. I am finding right now people all over the place that are just connecting and saying, uh, you know, I'm interested in church or why do you believe in God? And there's a real desire and need out there right now. And it's our job to be there to say, you know what, I'm not called to be uh, this, that and the other. I am called to be a disciple maker, to reach out to people and see their lives changed and see them discipled. Well, my prayer for you today is that as you go about your business, that today, by this time tomorrow, that you'll know a little bit more about discipleship, that you would have followed God today, that his will will be done in your life, and that you will see all that he has for you in this, in this day. Whatever time of day you're watching this, or watching it in bed at night, um, then whatever, but just know that the Lord has a plan and purpose for your life over this next few days, weeks and months and years that's about it for today but i want to pray lord i thank you for those that are watching and i pray now in the name of jesus lord that as we look at the life of dorcas something about her life would rub off on us and help us to say i'm going to go and make a difference in people's lives and lord maybe we're the peter today when somebody calls we go we pray and we see change and so lord i thank you for each person watching help us to be your disciples we need your help, Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching uh, God Day here on Revelation TV. We'll be back with lots more God Days, as you know. They're very popular, so there's lots more on the way. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. So have a great day. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, may you know God's blessing in your life. I'll see you soon.